This is the day the Lord has made. Welcome to all you brave souls who went out in the very cold. I don't know if there's such a thing as a Presbyterian popsicle, but I think we're all headed in that direction today. Uh, a special welcome to our visitors today, if there are any that are so brave to get out in this weather. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you for joining in the worship of our Lord in spirit and in truth. Uh, for members, friends, and visitors alike, please sign the friendship pad, which you'll see at the end of your pew, and pass it along. If you'd like us to know your contact information, uh, please add that. I promise we don't sell that to any marketing companies. Uh, and if you're new to us and you want us to uh, uh, know that you have an interest in joining, please identify that. Okay. Uh, Announcements this week. Uh, uh, from the Communication Committee, I want to uh, let everybody know that we have an important uh, congregational meeting next week, and that's for the Pastoral Nominating Committee. If you haven't been involved in that before, give some thought to participating in that. I've been in several Pastoral Nominating Committees, and they're always a great insight into what people are thinking in the church, and what's even more important is they help us establish a leadership that takes the church forward for five, ten, sometimes a longer period of time. And if you think about what you want the church to look like ten years from now, you'll probably Probably have no greater influence than you would in participating in the pastoral nominating committee. So please keep that in mind. It's next week, uh, next Sunday, right after uh, worship. And there's one other thing to consider. Uh, anybody can nominate themselves, and certainly feel free to do that. Uh, if you want to nominate somebody else, we ask that you let them know first and gain their acceptance rather than springing it on them uh, next uh, Sunday. So let's see, uh, pardon me while I fumble through this. Okay. Let's see, coming up this week, week uh, right after worship, we have Buildings and Grounds Committee that's meeting. On Monday, there's Bible study, and on Tuesday, there's book club, and I, I'd say pay attention to child story time. That may or may not happen, just like last week, depending, it's very dependent on the weather. Uh, and in the evening, there's the communication committee meeting at 6.30. Wednesday, again, there's Bible study in the bell choir. Uh, it will be in the evening at 6 o'clock. And then the member care committee meets at 9 o'clock on Saturday, next Saturday, at Linda Woodside's home. Keep an eye out for things in the uh, e-blast and in the newsletter. I'd like to introduce today our visiting pastor. It is Reverend Len Carroll. Uh, Len was telling me just before the service that he, he knows this congregation and he knows this community from having contacts many years ago. If you'd like to read more about Len's background, you can see it in the bulletin. And I think if I read this correctly, Len, you'll be with us several times over the next couple months, right? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, please get to know Len. He'll, he'll be with us for uh, the next several months on a regular basis. Now let's move into joys and concerns. Are there any joys today, including the fact that we're all here and in worship together and safe? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Other joys? Th oh, I'm sorry. Like a 
charm and thanks to Susan and John for helping out. <coughs> Any other comments? Concerns? Our brother-in-law, our brother-in-law Mike is still in, a, in the hospital with uh, complications from COVID. Uh, that we go out to and we want to get and let it fly. So, yeah, so. That's it. Michael, uh, I have a co-worker, Melinda Jackson, who is taking care of her elderly mother. And so I was with her up in prayer and uh, she'll give her strength and patience through this process. For those of you who concerns, please join me in our prayer. Caring God, I bring all that is on my heart to you this day. You are here, O oh Lord. Let us hold all these people in our hearts and prayers. Please rise in body and or spirit. 
At the Sea of Galilee, Jesus called out the best in his disciples. Follow me, he said, and the world changed. Here in this time of worship, Jesus calls out the best in his disciples. Follow me, he said. This is how the world will change. Let us sing our faith. My friends, if we say we have no sin, the truth is not in us, and we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of all of our sin and cleanse us from every unrighteousness. And so now, in penitence and in faith, let us be called forward to the throne of grace and confess our sin, both as people and as a church. Let us pray together. Forgive us, merciful God, for we do not know where to go from here. A new year is upon us, but everywhere we look, we find the same repeated actions. Deadly conflicts in the Holy Land, wars over borders, weapons too easily available, the challenges of holding different ideas, every relationship we have, including the one with ourselves. We are afraid, we are grieving, we are looking for change, and we are needing you. There is a wideness in your mercy, O oh God, but there is a wilderness in this world. Turn us around and show us your way. Resurrect our courage and our curiosity to new convictions of your faith, hope, and love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. 
The old life is gone, the new life has just begun. Friends, trust and hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As God has forgiven us in Christ, let us offer the peace of Christ to one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and also with you. Let us share signs of peace with one another. Old Testament reading today can be found in your pew Bible on page 860, Jonah chapter 3, 1 through 5, and verse 10. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nivea, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
What does that look like to you? And what are they doing? Running? Having fun? They are having fun. This is probably what your family does on a nice day. You go out and do that. Now I'm going to show you another picture. What do you think is going on in that picture? The boy looks hurt. Do they have smiles on their faces in this picture? I think it would be kind of sad, maybe. Worried about something? Well, the reason why they're sad is that that's a picture of um, a family in a, in a country called Ukraine. And right now, they're going through some problems in Ukraine. There's a war going on. And the problem is, is that children and their families have to leave the country. And when you have to leave a country, you're called refugees. And a few weeks ago, um, there was a Bible verse that was told to the adults. And um, the same thing almost happened to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph when they were forced to go to Egypt to escape. Um, the king was trying to harm our children who were Jesus' age. Well, that made them sad, and they kind of finally were able to come back into their country. But one of the things that I'd like to ask you, what do you think you can do to help children who are refugees? Be kind to them. Give them food, and hopefully where they are right now, they're getting food. But what I was thinking we could do today, and we're going to do this up in Children's Church, is to write letters to Ukrainian refugee children. And there's a there's an organization that they give us a little form and they give us an address. And we can write letters to them and hopefully give them something to be happy about and maybe give them some encouragement and some good words. Because I think it would be a little scary to be a refugee and have to leave your country and your home. So anything we can do to help those kids, I think, will make us feel better. But I know it's going to make them feel better. So why don't we pray? Dear God, help the families across the world who are scared and sad be able to once again play and laugh together in their own countries and in their own homes. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's go. I want to thank you for this opportunity to share good news this morning. You know, we always rely on the promise of God's people that where two or three are gathered, where we gather in this place now that the living Christ is among us. It is also good to be sharing in Mark's gospel with you this morning. It is by far one of my favorite books to read from the New Testament. You see, Mark's is a story of grace and urgency. It falls upon you, and you follow, you go. Don't you wish all changes in our life could happen that easily? a grace, an urgency. It is a story that takes Jesus' disciples and us on a life-changing journey, turns their life not only around, but upside down and inside out, and then returns them right back home to Galilee, probably returning them to at least for a while anyway, to the very same beaches we find them on this morning. We read this, actually, at the end of Mark's Gospel. As the women, standing at the entrance of an Easter tomb, hear the words, Do not be alarmed, but go. Tell his disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. Now Jesus returns his followers back to where it all began, and perhaps where it begins again and again and again. But this time it's different. They're changed. 
Galilee has probably been changed too. Galilee literally and metaphorically is where ministry happens. A ministry about people where we find God close and where we find God's own heart in this person and the example and the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This passage from Mark is all too familiar with us. Its pairing today is unique with the story from Jonah. The shared message is God's call to repent and quite honestly to just turn on some good news for a change, right? In the case of Jonah, God calls him to go to Nineveh, that great city, and to warn them to turn from their wicked and evil ways. But first, Jonah wants no part of it, we can see. I mean, even at the end of the story, Jonah is not fond of Nineveh or of the people or of God's relenting non-action towards them. But in the end, it is Jonah's own lesson to learn that God is compassionate and merciful and slow to anger, abounding in love towards all of life. And if God is concerned, perhaps Jonah might find compassion to be concerned too. You see, Jonah's lesson is it's always about people. Jonah delivered God's message of repentance throughout the streets of that great city, crying out for three days, the text told us. And the people of Nineveh did something that, quite honestly, didn't appear to be too difficult in the first place. They believed. Just like that. Just like fishermen dropping their nets and their lives and leaving their father in the boat with the hired men and following, going. The Hebrew translation from Jonah can also be read as to be turned. They believe. When the king of Nineveh even gets word of this, a decree goes out to everyone that they should all wear sackcloth and cry out mightily to God, the animals too. And God saw how they turned from their bad and violent ways, and it is said that God changed his mind. So God turned to, I see. These stories, in their very essence, these stories, in their own unique way, are brought together to remind us that we are called to turn to a God who has turned to us. And so let us pray now for the illumination of God's word from Mark's gospel. Chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. You can find this in your pew Bible in the New Testament on 34 if you would like to read along with me. Will you pray with me before we read the gospel? Let us pray. God of grace and God of glory, escort these ancient words of wisdom, well-traveled among your saints, to fall fresh upon us today. May your Holy Spirit move us to be inspired into your service, and may it move us from our complacency of certainty into a more curious faith and fellowship with one another. Through your word made flesh and dwelling among us now, in Christ we pray, amen. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
So Mark is really quick about getting Jesus into this seaside ministry of his. A short introduction from the words of Isaiah, a baptism by John in the Jordan, where Jesus, we hear, alone is the one who sees the Holy Spirit descending upon him and hears a voice from heaven naming him, my son, the beloved. A short temptation, and then Jesus speaks. His very first words in Mark's gospel. Time is now. God is near. Repent and believe in good news. God has turned to us. And now it's our turn. Repent. (laughs) Repent. Repent is such a funny word. It is such a funny word that I one time purchased a t-shirt that has a replica of a, a classic Andy Warhol artwork that says, repent and sin no more. It was just a fun way of understanding that word from maybe how hard it is to swallow sometimes. Repent. I used, I used to love to see the people's faces when I would wear that down the streets of New York City. You get a lot of good looks wearing a shirt like that in New York City. But repent is also a faithful word for us today. It is God's word for us today. And it's in both of these texts. It is a call to repent and believe in some good news for a change The Greek word, which I'm sure you've all heard this many times, the Greek word for the word repent is metanoia, which means to change directions or to change one's mind, or quite literally, to turn around, to do a 180. But to hear that word without the grace-filled urgency of Mark is a mistake. Because these words from Jesus also stop us in our tracks. Because to decide to turn around also acknowledges that I am heading in a direction I do not want to be going. Perhaps it's easier to hear repentance as a changing of direction, if you will, or a turning around. We are in these few weeks, three weeks now of a, of a brand new year. It is this time each and every year where we all try to physically, mentally, even spiritually turn a page, if you will. Dry Januaries, detoxes, cleanses, promises to exercise more and to eat right, read more. I'm going to read more this year. Breathe promised myself I'm going to breathe more this year. Lent is only a few weeks away. It is a time when we really start to focus our attention on spiritual disciplines. They become more of our practice. Even in our scheduled times of fellowship and meetings together, congregational meetings together even, We come to them with a deeper sense of hope for a new day dawning out of these snow-muffled cold ones. This all will melt away, and the tulips and the lilies of Easter will be here before you know it. But turning things around can sound like a lot. When I think about what needs to change, I think about all the things that need to change. And maybe that's just too much too soon, too often. And changing directions can also be tricky if you're not too sure exactly which direction to turn. Following Jesus can be a big choice. For many, that is a moment made in an adult's life, or even a young adult's life, when they choose to follow Jesus Christ as a, as a new birth, a new awakening, if you will. But for me, 
I stay firm in my faith that even before I could choose for myself at my baptism, in the font of grace, God's love claimed me as Christ's own forever. And then my parents and my church, they taught me about Jesus' life. They taught me how Jesus died and was raised from the grave. And I have been following that hope, that story, that old, old story that we make new, new, new every day. I have been following down this long and well-traveled road of faith my whole life. Now, my walk with God, I can confess, my walk with following Jesus Christ has not always come so easily. It has had its fair share of on and off ramps, if you will. Like Jonah, even I sometimes am not always on the same page as where God is wanting me to be. You may find yourself that way sometimes, too. And even then, I've learned that God is always trying to redirect my heart and my passions toward the next good thing. Maybe not the what I think is right thing, but the next good thing. Which is always about people, in case you're wondering. I think about all the things that need to change, and as I said to you earlier, I get a bit of apoplexy. It freezes me up sometimes. Or worst, worst case scenario, I can just start pacing around and not knowing what to do first. And then I think back to one of the best images I have of turning things around, of turning a bad situation into a better one, when our values and the things that are very important to us start to bubble up to the surface. And I think about a young Charlie Bucket. Charlie Bucket is the young boy in the original movie, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And how Charlie Bucket, at the end of that movie, bravely walks up to, to this sort of intriguing yet scary chocolate maker. And he leaves a candy called the Everlasting Gobstopper on the side of his desk. Now, you see, the other four children who actually got a golden ticket as well, just like Charlie, with the help of their parents, those four other children, they don't get to the end of the tour very well. And those four other children, with the help of their parent, they have already decided to give that candy, the everlasting gobstopper, to Wonka's candy rival, Arthur Slugworth. And Charlie's Grandpa Joe, feeling his grandson has been cheated and swindled by the false promises of Mr. Wonka, he turns to leave Wonka's office, vowing to sell their everlasting gobstopper to Mr. Slugworth as well. And I'm sure they would have all been rich, right? But Charlie stops in his tracks. And he turns to the goodness rising inside of him. And he returns, to Mr. he returns Mr. Wonka's candy to the edge of his desk. And we see Willy Wonka put his hand over that candy, and he says, so shines a good deed in a weary world. Now recently, my family and I went to see the new Wonka movie. There's a, a new Wonka movie a prequel of the original 1971 movie starring Gene Wilder, which I just referenced. This latest one stars a, a new actor named Timothy Chalamet, and the beauty of this one is they are not trying to remake the original one. This one, however, tells the story of how this mysterious, magical inventor and chocolate maker becomes Willy Wonka. Based on the 1964 Roald Dahl book called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, this version takes the liberty of showing us the early Willy Wonka before the factory, the one raised by a single mother who shares with her son a love for making and enjoying chocolate. And she reminds him often that every good thing in this world started with a dream, she says. So hold on to yours. Now, throughout this movie, the younger Willie's adventures, we see him pull out a bar of chocolate from the inner linings of his pocket. 
and his name is written on it, the word Wonka. Now, this is the last bar of chocolate that his mother made for him. And he continues to hear her voice when he holds it in his hand as a memory to her. And what he hears her say is, when you share your chocolate with the world, I will be there. Toward the end of the story, when Willie finally opens that bar of chocolate, the one his mother had left for him, there's a message in it for him, ironically written on a golden piece of paper. And it reads, it's not chocolate that matters. It's the people you share it with. When I think about repent or metanoia, a changing of directions or to turn around, it is helpful for me to hear these words inspired by the actions of a young Charlie Bucket to just go shine a good deed in this weary world. And when changing and turning all of this around seems so big, perhaps we just start there. A good deed in a weary world. We turn to God, who has turned to us. And we hear that word, repent, in a very different and changing way. Go shine a good deed. Go shine a good deed. Perhaps that will begin to change everything. But when I think about the work of ministry, the work of ministry that we are all called into, it is helpful for me to be reminded that the work of ministry, it isn't what really matters. Because the work of ministry, well, Give me the liberty here. It's kind of like chocolate. It's rich, sometimes satisfying. It is complex in its texture and mixture. It comes in all shapes and colors. It can be molded and fashioned into many outcomes. It can even be crunchy or nutty or smooth. Yeah, the work of ministry can be like chocolate. Because it isn't the work of ministry that matters. It's the people we share it with. In the name of the creator, redeemer, sustainer of all of life, thanks be to God.
Let us remain standing and let us affirm what we believe. We trust in God, whom Jesus called Abba, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally in God's image, male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. But we rebel against God. We hide from our Creator. Ignoring God's commandments, we violate the image of God in others and ourselves, accept lies as truth, exploit neighbor and nature, and threaten death to the planet entrusted to our care. We deserve God's condemnation, yet God acts with justice and mercy to redeem creation. In everlasting love, the God of Abraham and Sarah chose a covenant people to bless all families of the earth. Hearing their cry, God delivered the children of Israel from the house of bondage. And loving us still, God makes us heirs with Christ of the covenant. Like a mother who will not forsake her nursing child, like a father who runs to welcome the prodigal home, God is faithful still. You may be seated. Will you join your hearts with mine as we pray together? Creator God, our loving and heavenly parent, you have given us this particular time and space to be met by you. And we pray not so much for your presence this day as much as we pray for a deeper awareness of your presence this day. For you are as close to us as our very breath. And this morning we have heard you whispering words of belonging into each of our hearts, reminding us that you are God and we are your people. You are light, calling us to never hide our own. You are hope, O oh God, leading us into your promised new day. You are love, loving us into living instruments of your grace. And we bring to you all that we are and all that we have as our humble yet holy offering of gratitude and generosity. We give you thanks, gracious God, for you have given us your steadfast love. You are the giver and provider of all that sustains us. You lift us up when we are feeling down. You enliven our energies when our souls are tired. You give us wisdom when we become overwhelmed with information. You hold our emotions and our actions in loving mercy when we are headed in the wrong direction. You name us your beloved when we are struggling to love one another or ourselves. You provide pathways through the darkest of valleys, ones of our own making. You melt away all that deters us or troubles our movement, no matter how packed down or iced over they may become. We give you our hearts in thanksgiving for your son, Jesus Christ. And in him, would you not give us everything else? Gracious God, in the silence, hear our own prayers of joyful gratitude. But to pray for these things, for all the things we are grateful for without acknowledging a world of need just beyond our doors is to do so without faith or love. And so God, we pray again and as often as we must for every child and parent who goes to bed hungry today, for those imprisoned and abandoned and without shelter or a home today, for those who are hurting or who are sick, who are fighting to stay alive, for those who are struggling to remember who they are or who we are, for those who are struggling 
with the memories when it is really the moments we should savor. We pray with people who are living at war with one another or surrounded by wars that are not their own. We pray with everyone who hopes for a world of peace where there will be no more violence and no more crime, no more depression, no more suicide, no more shootings, no more riots, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying, no more death. And so we pray with all your children, O oh God, and even for ourselves, that you will give us a future full of hope, faith, and love, and that you will find us where we are and bring us back to you so that we may taste and see the promised new day you have in store for us. We pray this through Christ, in Christ, with Christ, by the power of your Holy Spirit. We make our prayers and our petitions to you silently and on our hearts, remembering that when we have no words to pray, you have given us beautiful words to pray. Praying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and all who dwell in it. Let us, with joyful gratitude, bring to God our offerings of ourselves, of our treasures, of our time. Let us bring to God what God needs.
God's who loves knows no ending. My friends, go out into the world and serve the Lord with passion and with purpose and with creativity. Trade no one evil for evil, but strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all of God's people as God's people. And now may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, the Holy Spirit keep you, that you may live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love, both in this time and place, and in every time and place. Go in peace, my friends. Let the service begin. Fine. I think it's still caught.